Hi, this is Coach Colette, and I am excited to welcome you to another episode of Coach Chat. And today's conversation is with my friend, Jennifer Sterling, who is the founder of the Body Full Healing Project, which really helps Black women to get more into their bodies so that they can be more present and more aware of how different forms of stress actually affect us. And this conversation was amazing. We talked all about how oppression can affect your body and your mental health, particularly for black women who are living in a constant state of deciding when it's safe to show up as our authentic selves and when we need to quote unquote code switch. And I was particularly floored when we started to have our conversation about depression. You may know that black women experience depression at 50% rates higher than white women. Yet in this conversation, we were talking about functional depression and how that impacts black women's mental well-being. So I really think that you are going to gain tips and ideas and insights on how to deal with what's coming at us as well as what we can do to more healthily release the stress, the anxiety, the microaggressions that we experience on a consistent basis as black women. So definitely get ready and listen up to this episode of Coach Chat. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Coach Chat. And today I have with me as my special guest, Jennifer Sterling. She is the founder of the Bodyful Healing Project, which we'll talk a little bit more about, which creates a safe space for open and honest conversations about mental health. By training, she's a dance and movement psychotherapist and also a holistic nutritionist. And probably the real exciting reason that I am inviting her to the show today is that she is the author of a new book called Dear Strong Black Woman, which you know all that if you were listening for a while, you know I have my Disrupt Strong hashtag. So Jennifer, welcome to this episode. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yes, I am so excited to have this conversation as two Black women, two Black women in wellness, two Black female entrepreneurs. There's a lot of synergy there and also really excited to have a conversation about how our mental health affects all of that. Absolutely. It's a, it's a topic, I think, that doesn't get as much attention as it should. So I'm excited to dive in there as well. Exciting, exciting. So so tell us a little bit more about the Bodyful Healing Project and how you came to launch this initiative. Yeah, the Bodyful Healing Project is something that I created to bring awareness to the ways in which mental illness affects our bodies, specifically depression, um, because there is such a strong correlation between the mental and the physical, which I think the more traditional um, medical practices don't necessarily tie the two together um, as much as, as they could. So it, part of it was that bringing that awareness and the other part was introducing a therapeutic modality to black women that I felt would be helpful given our cultural history of dance and movement and music and, um, it's not a therapeutic modality that I think a lot of people in general know about. So I was really excited to present it to 
black women as an alternative to talk therapy, um, just a creative way of healing in general. Yeah, that's amazing. I think, and I feel like we all can have more body presence and awareness. So it's exciting that you are doing that. And also I love that you said about bringing, bringing traditions back, right? Would you say that these aren't, I'm sure that you have your own modalities and your own spin on everything, yet there is this uh, ancestral knowledge around the importance of movement and dance, would you say? Absolutely. So even looking back into like chattel slavery and like the things that, um, the individuals who were enslaved did to maintain their own sense of resilience and hope. Um, Dance has been with us forever. (laughs) Movement has been with us forever. And even before we can speak, we're moving. So I wanted to really bring that aspect into the healing process and dance movement psychotherapy in and of itself doesn't necessarily consider those ancestral ties Um, It was the field itself was formed by, you know, a group of white women. And so there's a very different, you know, historical context there and a lot of appropriation. But for me, it's just realizing that all of these things are just a part of who I am culturally and a lot of the black women that I work with. And so tying that piece in, I find to be really powerful. Mm hmm. Right. That's uh, We could have a whole nother show on cultural appropriation and wellness. So maybe we should put a pin in that and come back to that. I'd, I'd love to have that conversation with you as well. Um, but I think it is interesting because for me personally, I, it sounds silly to say this, but I, I forget about movement sometimes. Like I feel like I, I'm a very cerebral person and my listeners know, probably know that about me already. And although I do things like EFT tapping, like those kinds of modalities do bring me into my body or even breath work. But do you find that that is common or that other women clients also kind of forget movement? Absolutely. I think in general, as a society, we put so much emphasis on the brain and the mind that it's really easy to forget that we have bodies and that there is a connection between our thoughts and the way that we move um, and the way that our bodies are present in the world. But even from the time that we're young, I know I worked with younger children for a little while and the very common phrase I heard all the time was like, use your words or think before you act. And so even for kids who are kind of innate movers and, you know, I think sometimes more present in their bodies than we tend to be as adults to immediately give them that frame of reference that like, no, what's happening in my body is less important than what's happening in my brain. Um, So then as we become adults, we carry all of that with us and our thought processes just kind of overtake everything and um, using that, you know, what's been deemed as like higher intelligence becomes a priority. Mm -hmm. I, f- I feel like, or I shouldn't say I feel, I, 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 it seems to me that a lot of the work that we do in wellness and potentially also in therapy, I'm not a therapist, but um, I, I, I'm curious about your opinion on this, is, is a lot of unlearning, right? Unlearning things that we were taught or indoctrinated or that were Um, suggested to us that are, like you're saying, counterintuitive to our natural evolution. What what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, (laughs) I totally agree. Um, I think it's, it's, it's learning and unlearning and learning again and relearning some things um, because there are so many things that we either learn from other people or places or things that we just kind of take on based on how we've been programmed to respond to situations and experiences that aren't always serving us in the best ways that they could. So it is a process of of really kind of looking at all of those things and figuring out what to keep and what to let go and what to shift for sure. Mm -hmm. And are there unique or different uh, aspects of that for black women? 
For what I find in working with Black women is that it's a lot of explaining and really getting them to understand how oppression affects their bodies. And it's a thought that I'm finding not a lot of um, not a lot of women are aware of that just kind of living in the world as a black woman affects your mental health, regardless of all the other trauma that you've been through, just that in and of itself is traumatic. And so that creates a different set of body awareness needs, um, which I, you know, is, is learning what that is learning how oppression affects the body, but then also unlearning you know, all of the things that we've been sort of consciously and unconsciously programmed to do because we are black women in the world. Um, Code switching, for example, picking and choosing, you know, when we can be our authentic selves, when we can show up as our authentic selves and how that feels in the body versus feeling the need to code switch in places that don't feel safe for us to show up authentically. And that's a very like cognitive process, but it's also the body protecting itself. If I shift into this space where I'm more acceptable or more palatable, um, then it's safer for me. And so the body takes on a, you know, a, a different form or shape than it may if we're in our authentic presence. So learning those things, unlearning if we choose to, um, it's a constant kind of back and forth. And I think as black women, we can't always let go of those things completely because we do live in a world where it's not always safe for us to be our authentic selves. Um, So then kind of figuring out how much we're wanting or needing to conform and how much we're kind of going to buck the system a little bit. Mm, Or a lot bit. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Uh, that, that's that's so so compelling what you what you shared and 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 we did a show uh, a few months ago on microaggressions and I did I had that conversation with three of my uh, team members and it was interesting there were uh, and we were all, we are all women of color so it was interesting talking about our reactions to micro microaggressions. And so it's interesting, like if you were to listen to that episode, I don't know that any one of us mentioned our bodies. And so I think Mm -hmm. that this is so interesting and why it's so rich to have you and have this conversation with you because we, we are often processing all of those experiences in our minds, right? And not necessarily as fully aware of how that, how those experiences are affecting our bodies. Absolutely. And I would say that I would imagine that those microaggressions are affecting to some extent, um, even if we're not aware. Um, Part of my thesis work was really kind of looking at the effect of microaggressions on the body. And the, the science actually says that the accumulation of those things has the same effect as you know, the things that we think of as more traumatic, so sexual trauma or physical violence or harm, um, because it's a constant barrage of of experiences that that accumulation affects our nervous system in much the same way. It also contributes to our mental health as far as the development of depression and anxiety. And one of the reasons why black women tend to experience depression at rates that are 50% higher than white women. You know, so it's it definitely affects us in, in more ways than just like um, our thought processes, processes. Does it have anything to do with our um, fight, flight or freeze response in terms of where we're where we're either in one of those states and and how often we spend in one of those states? Sure. So everybody is is different, but what tends to happen with fight or flight is that when you are initially under threat, your nervous system activates into fight or flight, which is like the state where you can fight, you know, or run. 
Um, and then over time, when you're in that place for a really long time, which tends to be the experience of a lot of the black women in the studies that I read. So we're in this place of like always kind of looking out for the next thing, the next microaggression, the next racist um, attack, so to speak, so that we're always in this state of hyper arousal or fight or flight. And then eventually all of those, you know, your body's giving off all those hormones, but it can only stay in that place for so long. So what happens eventually is that you then shift down into hypo arousal, or you can shift into hypo arousal where the body just says, okay, I'm too tired to fight. And then we end up in this place of depression. Wow. So, and, and, and that's so interesting to think about it because I think I can think of instances where I've had that reaction, right? And so I, I can think of it viscerally, right? In, it's funny, like they say, the body never lies, right? So it's almost like my body is reminding me, yeah, when so-and-so said this, this is where I went to. And so where, where is the challenge? Is it about, I heard you mention time, is it the length of time that we spend in any one of those states? Or what? where does it start to become um, long, have negative impacts, long-term negative impacts on our health, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, so constantly experiencing those things with no um, downtime or no space to kind of discharge or process those things is when it becomes problematic. So we have the stress of our like everyday lives and then we have this sort of racial trauma. And the combination of those two and experiencing those two constantly, um, there's no, everybody kind of experiences trauma differently. So what could be really traumatic for one person in one instance may not be for another person, but the accumulation of over, you know, in the study that I read, it was, they were looking at, you know, several years. Um, But chronic stress, even, you know, for three months can affect your hormone balance. So it's, I think for black women, really important to understand that this is life (laughs) to an extent, but also within that to try and create spaces or find spaces where we can have the conversation and say, oh my goodness, this happened. Um, Or find spaces where we can actively kind of discharge that energy so it's not being stored in our bodies. And so we have a greater capacity to deal with the things that are happening in our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you're talking about discharging the energy, is that where the, the movement or the dance comes in? Yeah. So a lot of the work that I do in dance movement psychotherapy is really helping regulate the nervous system um, and bringing, helping women to find ways to bring their nervous system back into balance so that they're not always in that state of hyper arousal or fight or flight that things can happen and then we can shift back down and then something else can happen and we can shift back down but we're not always in a place where we're kind of searching or on alert and waiting for the next you know thing to happen Mm -hmm. and also I, I at least I can't speak for anyone else I think for me right there's the 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 action something happens i have my response and we also talked about in our other episode the fact that there's a distinction between the microaggression so to speak coming at me versus mm-hmm. coming at someone else or another group and i feel like we talked about the fact that it can be easier if you will to come out of that state of arousal when it's, I'm witnessing it and to be able to jump into, Oh, let's have a conversation about that versus when it's a personal attack, then I, it may take a little longer to process out of that fight, flight or freeze mode to be in a cognitive state where I can actually have now a conversation about what happened. Yeah. So the detachment of having some, having, having it not happen to you personally, for sure. 
Yeah. And that, I mean, it also kind of varies per person. Some people will experience what you call vicarious trauma, which is just the trauma of hearing someone else's story or watching someone else experience something. Um, but there is, there can also be that aspect of kind of it separation where it didn't happen to me. So I can see what happened from the outside and just kind of move on. Um, and then the direct attack that's a little bit harder to let go because that for a lot of us brings up a lot of different things, shame, guilt, you know, wondering, you know, why things are happening to us. So it, it can, based on what your lived experiences can trigger a whole other host of of thoughts and, and feelings. Hey, it's Coach Colette. What do you think of the episode so far? What are your main takeaways? Before we jump into the next segment, I have a question for you. What's at stake for your health if you continue living your current routine? The thing is, we get so used to doing things in the same ways. We're actually more afraid to make changes than we are to live out our worn out routines, even if they are causing us to feel ill, stressed, or overwhelmed. Can you imagine what it would be like to wake up in the morning and not have it hurt when you get out of a bed and to feel excited about your day? It is possible when you start within, and I'd like to help you to do it. You can visit my website, startwithincoaching.com, and at the top, click Start Here to schedule your complimentary activation call. We can talk about what's going on in your life right now, how you are in your health, and where you would like to be. So go to startwithincoaching.com and click Start Here to start your journey within. I want to ease ease our conversation into into your book and and thinking about this concept of you know the strong black woman and I guess I, I'm sure you, you why don't you tell us what what this this myth is about the so called strong black woman? Yeah, so the strong black woman has kind of two definitions, if you will. So there's the definition and the, like the origin story of it, which is very much rooted in um, racism, oppression, slavery, in that it was the idea that black women don't experience pain. Um, And so, you know, that kind of became the reason why there were studies on black women's genitals that where they weren't given anesthesia because they just won't feel it. Um, they're, you know, the abuse and that sort of thing. Well, they don't, they don't feel anything. They're like strong women, which kind of ties into the idea of like the fragile white women. So white women are fragile. They have all these feelings. They're hysterical and black women are like strong and they don't feel pain. And so we can kind of use and abuse them in a sense. And that kind of shifted as something that, you know, if you go by Dr. Joy Degree's um, philosophy of post-traumatic slave syndrome, perhaps something that we've kind of passed down generationally, and as this idea that we have to be strong, that is the perception of us, that is just what we are. And so we've kind of taken this on as almost like a personality trait, and it's something that keeps us from sometimes seeking help and support because we're supposed to be strong. We're supposed to have it together. We're supposed to have it handled. If we're not, then we're considered weak or incapable or unintelligent. Um, And it's also something that keeps a lot of black women from getting help when they are experiencing depression. So black women experience depression more than white women, but it's often either untreated or misdiagnosed simply because black women are functional a lot of us, and that's a word that I've used even for myself, like I'm functionally depressed. 
I know I, I have the, these feelings of like persistent sadness and, you know, kind of go down the list of depression symptoms and can say, oh, okay, yeah, but I can get up and do what I need to do. And life keeps moving. Like you just keep pushing. Uh, so when you go and see a doctor, they're testing functionality. A lot of them, when they're looking at, you know, diagnosing you with depression, is your depression impeding upon your day-to-day life? And for a lot of us, it's not because we don't have the privilege of not being able to go to work or not, you know, doing what we need to do to get by. Um, so it's, it's twofold. It was something that started a long time ago and something that we've kind of internalized in a sense for better or for worse. Mm, wow. Thank you. Thank you for that really comprehensive um, description. And I want, I'll, I'll, comment on both so with the origin story what stands out to me is how that perception of not black women not feeling pain lives until this day in terms of we can talk about the mental health side but i'm thinking also the physical health side in terms of black women going to doctors and not getting the uh the care that they that they need based on this stereotype. For sure. It definitely still happens in act the, the other side of medicine as well. There was a, an article I was reading that said that black women, both black women and black men are less likely to be given pain medication when they're experiencing pain um, or likely to be given a lower dose than a white woman who comes in and says, I'm in pain. And that carries back to, you know, that the initial stereotype of black women not feeling pain and also the fragile white women, woman. So we're, you know, we're still living it, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from an intersectionality standpoint, neither stereotype serves women at all. No, (laughs) not at all. You know, I mean, I think, you know, there's the sense of, and from my, from my what I've talked about is, you know, the hashtag disrupt strong, which is talking about redefining this concept of strong, not meaning vulnerable, not meaning seeking help. And then if you think about it on the other side, right, like I wouldn't necessarily want to be called fragile either. Right. So there, it's interesting when we, when we think about language, I was an English major in college. So (laughs) semantics are very important to me. So that, that sense of once we put labels on things, right, it, it really does, put women in a box uh, or or in two different boxes and and neither box really allows for the full expression of the self. Absolutely. And I I think our societal definitions of strong and fragile could use a little restructuring, um, which is why I love that hashtag because there's so much that goes into creating a stereotype. Um, and so to really look at, like, is it act, does it make me fragile to ask for help? Does it make me weak to seek support, to come to a place where I can reach out and know that, like, sometimes things happen a little easier when we're in community with each other. And we've kind of been sold this lie that we should be doing everything on our own all the time. And you know, ancestrally, that's not how things were done. You know, community was a huge part of history, even if we're just going back to, even if we're just going back to chattel slavery and the way that slaves kind of organized themselves to try and make sure that everyone was taken care of, um, communally making sure that everybody had food, um, taking measures to make sure that, you know, if somebody did something that they would get in trouble for, that there was a system of protection in place among them. Um, So it's not, we haven't historically been functioning as single entities. So, you know, is it actually weak to seek support? No, but in the society that we live in and with the stereotypes that we have, that's what we're left with. Mm -hmm. And, and on the, on the second a more current narrative around strong black women. I am, I was almost floored when you were saying the things about 
functional depression. And I thought, wow, okay, maybe I need to take one of these assessments because I think it, it's so true. I mean, like I said, when we started, black woman, black female entrepreneur, that sense of, uh, and when I started this concept of hashtag disrupt strong, you know, I, 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 said that, you know, I'm living in the narrative at the same time that I'm trying to disrupt it. And, and your comments around functional depression and being functional through your pain just really resonated with me. And I, I think that, uh, yeah, how, how did you come to that realization, I guess, is the question. Yeah, it was a lot of my own personal experience. I started having feelings of depression when I was like 15 and I remember the doctor saying to me like yeah but you're like doing everything that you're supposed to do so I don't know if it's really depression or you know maybe there's something else going on um and that was like for me kind of an eye-opener because I had watched my mom um go through some of the same things she had actually been diagnosed but you know, even on her worst days, she somehow managed to get up and go to work and come home and cook for six kids. And I would often hear her like crying in her room or, you know, really kind of hopeless. Um, and sometimes she would say like, I just don't want to be here anymore. But completely functional. Like if you knew her outside of home, you would think she was fine. You put on a happy face, you do what you need to do, and you keep it moving. So when my doctor said that to me, I just felt like, oh, my goodness, I'm, like, reliving. <laughs> I'm going to have that same life. And that, to me, just didn't feel good. Um, and so that was, like, the beginning of kind of looking into things. And it was a curiosity that carried with me into my graduate work and kind of fascinating looking at the research and, and seeing like, I'm not alone. Like I'm not the only person who experiences this and reading other women's accounts um, just kind of confirm that like, there's so many of us that are at home feeling sad and hopeless and just bone tired all the time. But when we go out that door, it's, it's a completely different story because we have to, we feel like we have to. And, and part of what you were mentioning when you, when you first describe it, part, part of it attributing potentially to the strong black women, woman narrative, and then another part attributing to the economics, right. In sort of, in terms of not necessarily having, like you said, the privilege of not functioning in order to earn a living. Yeah, capitalism kind of sucks. <laughs> Particularly when it comes to mental health, yes, yes, yes. And in, and in many other, many other ways. Um, so, so what is your message? Um, I'm presuming, dear strong black woman, right? There's, there are some tips or help that you are suggesting for, for us. Yeah, so within the, the book, the book is actually a series of letters. So I took my thesis um, because I figured nobody really wants to read a thesis. <laughs> I like the research, but your average person is like, all this data, I'm good. Um, so I took the more, um, the parts of my thesis that I felt like were more relatable and turn them into letters to women who identify as strong black women. And the letters are exploring the historical context of the stereotype and talking about how it came to be. And then also offering ways to reframe that stereotype. So shifting, you know, one of the letters is talking about shifting parenting and the idea of discipline and whipping and where that came from. Um, and the other one is, is there are other ones that are talking about kind of redefining what strong is. Can we be strong and vulnerable at the same time? Can we be strong and still seek support? Um, so there's definitely, I tried to tie in both the historical context so we know where things are coming from and then also kind of redefine um, the ways in which we, we do things and the ways in which we see ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
And is there one like practice or one movement that you have found either for you personally has worked well or perhaps that your clients have given you feedback about? So the one thing that I feel like people identify with, the women that I work with, uh, that they identify with is just kind of shaking. Um, And shaking can be cathartic. um, And it's something that I think we can all do without feeling like too self-conscious about it. Um, So sometimes, you know, just kind of like shaking your hands or shaking your shoulders or shaking your body, like that's kind of symbolic of like letting things go. Um, And it does sometimes offer, you know, some reprieve. um, And that kind of comes from studying the way that animals kind of move through trauma. Um, If you watch um, dogs, if they've had a really stressful situation, they'll like shake their bodies. Um, So that comes from that space. And like I said, sometimes can be cathartic. There's usually still other things that you have to kind of sort through, but in the immediate time, that's something that most people can identify with. Right. That's great. I've, I've done that as well. uh, Shaking. And, and I do find that it it helps also, it really just helps to get the energy moving. And then right. That sense of if there, uh, for me, sometimes if there's a mantra or something you're saying, like letting go or whatever it is to, I mean, literally to shake it off. I mean, that is a phrase in our vernacular, right? Like shake it off. And so taking that concept a little bit more literally, it sounds like you're saying could be really helpful. Yeah, it, it's helpful in the like immediate, you know, if you don't have any other way to kind of process and you got to keep going to just like, physically shake kind of see if you can down regulate a little bit and and go about your day um but usually there's still some stuff under there but in the immediate time it works for a lot of people Mm -hmm. yeah i think and it is helpful to think of uh, those quick tips that people can use in the moment and then like you're saying obviously wanting to have deeper experiences or conversations or move more movement experiences with um, professionals like you. So, so how can our listeners learn more about you and the work that you're doing? So my, um, sorry, (laughs) the website, the bodyful healing project.com. And I'm also on all of the social media platforms at bodyful healing so they can find out more about the work there um, and find out a little bit more about me as well. Great, great. And I know that there's some online interactions that people can have with you so that if they're not in like our New York area, they can still be able to benefit from, from your work. Is that correct? Yeah. So I do offer virtual coaching. Most of that is, is more kind of nutrition based. Um, but I do offer virtual coaching for people who aren't in New York state. Um, and I also offer some online classes. Um, I recently just had a class on oppression in the body where we talked about, you know, how oppression affects black women and we'll be doing some more, um, monthly. So there's that opportunity as well. That's great. And I love this concept of body full, right? I think that what was that intentional, that sense of, I mean, I don't know that you can be body empty, but I, I guess what is that origin for 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 the name of the company? It is exactly what you mentioned. So being body full is just kind of knowing, understanding, and feeling that you have a body, even if your body is not the shape, size, or doesn't look the way that you want it to look. And that came from the idea that we can be connected to our bodies and we can also be disconnected from our bodies. So the idea of embodiment versus disembodiment. And for me, it was a play on mindful. So shifting away, you know, the emphasis of the mind and coming back to the body. So all of those things kind of tied into the name and really creating space for black women to talk about their bodies and connect to their bodies in a way that might be new for a lot of people. 
Mm, I love that. So instead, of, or in addition to being mindful, to be bodyful. I love that. Thank you. Well, Jennifer, this has been such an amazing conversation, and I know that we could go on and on. And so I'm thinking, yes, I want to put a pin in that conversation about appropriation and wellness and continue the dialogue another time about uh, this concept of helping strong black women to heal and and take more more um, not I don't want to say control of our bodies right it's being more aware of our bodies yeah I would love to continue the conversation I think it's it's an important topic to dive into yeah for sure Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us today and for sharing your pearls of wisdom. And everyone should definitely be on the lookout for Dear Strong Black Woman uh, wherever you find your books. And thank you, Jennifer, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Yes. And so, listeners, I hope that you have gotten some insights from this conversation. I know that I am definitely taking some thoughts for myself to consider and reflect upon. And until next time, this is Coach Colette helping you to start within to finish strong.